All right. So today what we're going to do is we are going to discuss a whole new topic which is glycolysis. Glycolysis. Now, we've been moving through the series of metabolic pathways and particularly metabolic biochemistry and what we have talked about include things like metabolism in itself, we've talked about bioenergetics and we have also talked about the electron transport chain. Now, today what I want us to do, I want us to discuss glycolysis. So what is this? Glycolysis is particularly a metabolic pathway which describes how the cells are going to use that glucose which you consumed to produce energy in form of ATP as well as intermediates. That is what glycolysis is particularly all about. Now, glycolysis is going to occur inside the cell, particularly in the cytosol of the cell. To best understand glycolysis and how it's going to proceed, one of the key things that you have to have in mind is when really does glycolysis occur the most? When is it at its height? That's the first thing you need to think about. And I have to speedily tell you that glycolysis occurs the most when you have consumed a carbohydrate-rich meal. When you look at the other topics that we've discussed, such as how insulin comes into play, you discover that when you consume a carbohydrate-rich meal, this is going to be broken down through the process of digestion, assimilated in your duodenum, and ultimately this is going to find itself in the portal venous blood, stimulate insulin secretion, which will ultimately lead to entry of the glucose inside the cells and activation of the phosphoprotein phosphatase, which is going to dephosphorylate a number of enzymes and ultimately increase, increase glycolysis, right? So at this point in time, I want you to start from the point where this glucose has entered into the cell and it's going to be used as a source of energy. So, let's look at how the process of glycolysis itself occurs. I've already told you that the key thing of glycolysis is to drive this reaction. ADP plus a phosphate to produce ATP. This is probably the key thing. It's interesting that most of the time we really think about the reverse of this reaction where ATP is being broken down into ADP and a, part, and a phosphate, right? However, glycolysis becomes the source of this energy we need, which is the plus, plus 7.3 kilocalories that we need in order for us to add the phosphate back to ADP. This is the drive, the reaction that glycolysis is going to drive. And this is going to happen thanks to the glucose that you have consumed in your meal. So, this reaction has particularly 10 cascades of reaction. It has 10 cascades of reaction. Of this reaction, you have three reactions that are irreversible. The most interesting thing of things uh, is that the most interesting part of things is that it is these same three reactions which are irreversible that are catalyzed by the enzymes which are regulatory enzymes. So you notice that reaction one, reaction three, and reaction number ten are irreversible and they are the ones that are catalyzed by the regulatory enzymes of glycolysis. So you have your groups. They say this is your glucose. So you have your alpha D glucose there. How is this alpha D glucose going to be broken down or catabolized to produce ATP or at least to generate enough energy to drive this reaction? So the first thing is that with the help of ATP, which is energy, the glucose is going to be 
phosphorylated to glucose 6 phosphate. So a phosphate would move from there, from there, and and there, so that your end product is going to be a glucose 6 phosphate. So there comes the the phosphate which came from ATP. Now this reaction is going to occur in almost all the cells and particularly it will have enzymes that are going to exist in isoforms. One of the enzymes is called hexokinase while the isoform which is found in the liver, the isoenzyme of this found in the liver is called glucokinase. And probably I should advise you to go and look at a question which compares and contrasts the two enzymes. That can be a sample question. Compare and contrast hexokinase and glucokinase. The next thing is that once you have produced this glucose 6-phosphate, it is then going to be isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate. This is an isomerization reaction and therefore it is a reversible reaction. So here you have your fructose 6-phosphate. Now, at carbon number six, you have phosphate. So you have your fructose six phosphate there. This is your fructose six phosphate. It's an isomerization reaction. And in this reaction, the enzyme that catalyzes it is called glucose 6-phosphate isomerase other books would still call it phosphoglucose isomerase it's an isomerization reaction you notice that this is changing from uh, pyramus shape to furanose shape from the glucose 6-phosphate to the fructose 6-phosphate this here is your reaction 1 that is a reaction two, and the third reaction is where this fructose six phosphate is going to receive another phosphate from ATP. ATP producing ADP and outputting this fructose. is going to be phosphorylated at two points which is at carbon number six and at carbon number one now i think at this point one of you is going to ask me a question to say look we are trying to make atp why then are we using atp right because we want to make atp why are we using atp by the way, the enzyme catalyzed in this reaction is called phosphotryptokinase. And to be specific, this is phosphotryptokinase 1. So the question which we are asking is that why are we using ATP and yet we are trying to, to produce ATP? Well, the reason is simple, you are trying to activate this, this molecule so that it can give you more energy. An analogy would be like the way we normally do business, right? You are going to invest in a bit of some money and then carry out your business and after the business you yield off more money. So this is what is happening. You are investing in some ATP there and investing in the other ATP here and then ultimately you will get more. ATP, which is 
more energy. This here is your reaction three. And I'm also pleased to tell you that the glycolysis itself is going to be divided into two parts, right? You will see the first part where we are investing energy, such as here and there, and then you will see as we go further that we will start yielding that energy that we have invested. So there is this phase which we invest in energy called the investment phase, and then as we go further, you will see what is called the payoff phase, which is where we are receiving the energy in form of ATP. Alright? So, this is your third reaction, and I have already told you that reaction 1 and reaction 3 are catalyzed by this uh, regulatory enzyme. I must be pleased to tell you as well that it is this regulatory enzyme that is the most important when it comes to regulating glycolysis. Okay? This enzyme here is called phosphatokinase 1, and the 1 must be emphasized because what this enzyme is doing is that it is putting its phosphate at carbon number 1, like that. However, there is a possibility to put the phosphate not at carbon number 1, but at carbon number 2, to form fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, a molecule that I'll come and explain when it comes to regulation of glycolysis. That is catalyzed by a whole different enzyme called phosphatokinase 2. Therefore, if you are talking about glycolysis, be sure to mention that the enzyme is not just phosphatokinase, but phosphatokinase 1. Is that okay? Great. So the next thing is this. Once you have this molecule here, which is fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate the fructose 1,6 bisphosphate is going to be split into two molecules so fructose 1,6 bisphosphate is going to be broken into two molecules this is done by the enzyme alveolase let me be consistent and write this in green is the green very visible, guys? Okay. The enzyme here is out the lens. It's going to break down this fructose into three, into two molecules. So it's going to split it into two. Though you cannot know which carbons went into one or the other, you will notice that the molecules that will be actually produced are going to be phosphorylated trioses. So one of them is dihydroxyacetyl phosphate and yes it is it is a ketose dihydroxyacetyl phosphate the other one is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This here is glycerol aldehyde 3-phosphate. And I'm pretty sure that you know about glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetyl. and dihydroxyacetyl. You know that if they don't have the phosphates, these are actually monosaccharides with free carbons. They are triacids. This here is the aldehyde group. This here is the ketose group. So these two are the three triose phosphates 